Hey everybody, this is Trinity Church Online. My name is Jose. I'm one of the pastors on staff here, and we're so grateful to have you here and um, have this opportunity to worship with you. As always, after the service, after the message, uh, please stay tuned for some more information about our ministries and how to get connected. And as always, thank you for joining us, and we're looking forward to worshiping with you. Let's pray to open up the service. Father, I just want to thank you for this day, another day that you've blessed us to be on planet Earth. Uh, please help us as we all um, negotiate these times and um, help us to honor you. Pray for Pastor Chris uh, as he opens our service and leads us in a uh, word of, uh, that you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen.
I thought throughout the universe displayed Then sings my song, my Savior God to thee How great thou art, and how great thou art Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to Trinity Church Online. And as we uh, continue to, to dive into our study in the book of 1 Thessalonians, before we, we get started, I want to take just a, a minute to wish uh, just everyone a, a happy, happy Memorial Day weekend and just to take a, a moment to, to remember those who uh, gave their life in the line of duty for, to serve our country, and that's what Memorial Day is all about, to remember those uh, who, who did make that ultimate sacrifice, so just is so reminiscent. Uh, it's such a scriptural thing because the Bible talks about the, the willingness of someone to lay their life down for someone else. It's a model of what Jesus did for us on the cross. And so we want to just take a moment uh, to remember those. If you have relatives or loved ones who made that sacrifice, uh, you know, our hearts go out to you. Uh, and, and we want to take a moment just to honor those who gave their lives for this country. Uh, and so, you know, we have the privilege of being able to spend it, and, uh, and this year it's obviously a little bit different than it has been in the past in the way we can spend Memorial Day, but uh, whether you're going to be outside grilling or whatever you're going to do, just remember this weekend uh, why you have the freedoms and why we have the freedoms that we have. Uh, and it's for so many people, so many uh, courageous men and women gave their lives for those freedoms. And so uh, we do want to jump into the book of First Thessalonians this morning. And we are going to continue our study on certainty and uncertain times. And when we think about being certain of things and what we can be certain of during all of this, this just uncertainty surrounding everything that's going on, uh, this morning we want to look at the fact that we can be certain uh, of the Word of God and the Gospel. Now, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, 
Paul starts off talking about the Thessalonians and their faith and their, the example that they set for others by following the example Paul set for them. And then as we continue on in chapter 2, Paul kind of transitions into talking about being a minister of the gospel. He takes a lot of time defending his faith because there was some very stern opposition to everything that he was doing. And even after he had left, uh, the Thessalonian church was facing persecution and opposition and people that were slandering Paul and Silas and Timothy in, in, in the manner in which they conducted themselves while they were among the Thessalonians. And Paul defends that. And he's going to continue, he kind of finishes that thought, and then he's going to transition back into being thankful for the, th- for the Thessalonian believers uh, as we pick this up in chapter 2, verses 13 to 16. And so this is what he says. He says, And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from, our, from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them at last. And so, as we look at this idea of what can we be certain of during these uncertain times, uh, what we want to look at this morning is the Word of God, the the Gospel. Now, Paul uses that phrase in this passage, the Word of God, and I want to be very clear what he's referring to, because many times when you or I sit down to read the Bible in the morning, if you're having your devotions, your quiet time, whatever, you sit down and you see that phrase, the Word of God, and what do you automatically think of? Well, many of us think of, of this, the Bible. The Word of God, this is what we ref- the Bible refers to itself as the Word of God. We, you've probably heard it referred to that, that way so often. Uh, but I do want to point out contextually that when the Thessalonians would have heard this or read this letter, uh, their understanding of that phrase, Word of God, would have differed from ours in a slight sense because uh, you know, they didn't have all of this put together the way we have it. They had the Old Testament scriptures. They had the law and the prophets and all those things. But, I mean, First Thessalonians is, is among many, you know, uh, many people believe that it was the first letter Paul wrote or one of the first letters Paul wrote. So he didn't have all the, the epistles that Paul had sent out that we have in our New Testament. They didn't have, they might have had the Gospels um, in some written form or some variation of it, but most likely it was all an oral thing at the time. It was handed down through, the, through, through speech. And so when Paul is talking about the Word of God, he's specifically talking about the message of the Gospel. And so we're going to use those kind of interchangeably because today if you were to sit down and go through the Bible and you read through the Word of God, what you're going to find is that this is all about the message of the gospel. That is what this is all about, that God is glorified through his redemption of mankind, through his son, Jesus, and what Jesus did on the cross, and then rising again three days later to conquer sin, to conquer death, and how he has made a way for us to be reconciled to to him. And that's the message. So we're going to be using those phrases kind of interchangeably. Paul is referring specifically to the message of the gospel that he taught and that he preached when he was among the Thessalonians. So we want to just clarify that before we jump in. Because when we start to talk about being certain of the word of God, certain of the message of the gospel, uh, there's, there's really four things we want to look at this morning found in this passage that help us and can encourage us, can strengthen us during uncertain times. Uh, the first is that when we talk about the word of God, we talk about the message of the gospel, it's that it, it comes from God through man. It comes from God through man. Uh, the Word of God is such an amazing thing, and it just starts with its source. The source of the gospel, the source of, of what we have today, the Word of God, our Bi- the Bible here, uh, it is all directly uh, from God. He is the source. We're told in multiple places in Scripture uh, that it is the Word of God, that the words in the Bible come directly from God Himself. Uh, passages such as 2 Timothy chapter 3, Verses 14 to 17, says, it says this, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. 
all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So the Word of God is just that. It's of God. It's from God. It comes directly from God Himself. Uh, the method of delivering that message or the Word is, is through man. And that's happened all the way from the beginning of, of time to, to, you know, throughout Scripture. And so we see this specifically expressed in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 23 to 25. He says this, Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding Word of God, all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the Word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So who did the preaching? Peter is saying, we did the preaching to you. But what we preached to you was the word of God. It was the message of the gospel. And that remains forever. And so Paul begins in verse 13 with a very similar statement to what he expressed all the way back in verse 3 of chapter 1. He states that we give thanks to God always for all of you constantly mentioning you in our prayers. And that's that chapter 1, verse 3. That's how he starts the letter to the Thessalonians. And we've spent about four or five weeks so far going through this, the first chapter and a half. In verse 13, he goes back to that first initial thought. Whereas he started uh, in the majority of the first two chapters expressing to the Thessalonians the reason he is thankful for them then moves into defending the ministry and, and the work he did among the Thessalonians. Here he transitions back to the spirit of thanksgiving and uses a very similar phrase. And that phrase is, and we also thank God constantly for this. It's the beginning of verse 13. And so you might be asking yourself right now, uh, what's he thankful for here? He says, we, are th- we also thank God constantly for this. And so he's going to continue to explain it. And what's he thankful for? Well, specifically, he's thankful for the way the Thessalonians responded to the gospel. If you look at verse 13, and he says, We thank, also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. And so when we think about this, what's he thankful for? He's thankful for the way the Thessalonians responded to the gospel. Well, how did they respond? Well, we see two different ways they responded. The first is that they received the word of God through hearing it. They received the word of God through hearing it. The word for received here uh, means to willingly take to oneself. In other words, it is a a very similar word to the word that is, it's something that you hear and then you you draw to yourself. You you internalize it and you you kind of, you dwell on it. You think it over. Uh, The Thessalonians embraced the message of the gospel that was preached to them. Which, which leads to another question, uh, how did they receive it? How did they receive it? Well, it's simple. Through the preaching they heard from the Apostle Paul. They heard it from Paul. They heard it from Silas. They heard it from Timothy. Paul points out that they received the word of God which they heard from us. And we talked about it. We, that's what we're saying. The, the word of God is from God through man. Men uh, are his chosen instruments to convey the word to his people. And in this case, to the Thessalonians, he used Paul and Silas and Timothy. Uh, Secondly, first they received it through hearing, and secondly, they accepted it as the word of God. So not only did the Thessalonian believers receive the word of God or the gospel, but they accepted it for what it was, the word of God. This has an element of going back to previous verses where Paul is defending his ministry, defending the validity of it to the Thessalonians, but it, goes, it just goes so much deeper than that here. And, and what, he is, uh, what he's saying is that the Thessalonians understood that Paul was simply an instrument. That this message wasn't something Paul had invented. It wasn't something Paul had made up. The gospel was not some story that was concocted by a group of people gathered together to try to convince people to believe something. They, they understood and they believed that Paul was the instrument God was using to get the gospel to the Thessalonians. And they accepted that. They, when they listened to the teaching of Paul, they accepted it as coming from God, not from Paul's own, you know, just mind or, or whatever. Uh, 
the, the word accepted here uh, in the Greek means to accept with a deliberate and ready reception of what is offered. To receive kindly and so to take to oneself what is presented or brought by another. It means to welcome as a teacher, a friend, or a guest into one's house. The word describes accepting something or a person with open arms, minds, and hearts, even going beyond normally expected gracious hospitality. So what what Paul is saying is he's so grateful that first the Thessalonians received the word, they heard it, and they, they, they brought it near to them, and then secondly, that they accepted it, they embraced it, that they didn't just bring it into their homes, but they allowed it to have free reign in their hearts. And, and, and that is the power of the Word of God. That's the power of the Word of God. Paul reminds the Thessalonians that they did not accept the teaching of a person. This is not somebody's individual thoughts on how to live a good life. This is not someone's own ideas of what is right and wrong. They, it, it wasn't because they liked Paul or they wanted to please him they accepted the teaching of Paul and Silas and Timothy. The message of the gospel is coming directly from God himself. This is what scripture is. It's the word of God handed down from him through his chosen instruments. That's why we can trust the Bible. That's why even though the Bible was written by many different men over hundreds and hundreds of years, it is in fact God's message to us and not some man-made myth or fable. We can be certain of the word of God. It is from God through men. And the second thing we see in this passage is that the word of God in the message of the gospel, it has the power to change hearts. Paul finishes verse 13 and his description of the message of the gospel uh, as the word of God and not just Paul's opinion by referring to the change that it brought about in the Thessalonians themselves. And he's going to look at this from two perspectives. The first one, he starts by talking about the change that occurred. Uh, it occurs in a person's heart when they accept the truth of the gospel. And so he uses the phrase at the end of verse 13, which is at work in you believers. The word of God, it came from, not from men, but what it really was, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. Now you may think, think this sounds pretty general, right? This might be like, okay, well, that you know, sounds obvious. It's at work. What does that mean? But it's this phrase at work that's the key to understanding the meaning of this phrase. The phrase at work is the Greek word. It's just one word in the Greek. It's the Greek word energeo, uh, from which we get the English word energy. And it means to work effectively to cause something to happen, to energize, to operate, to work effectually in. It means power in exercise and is used only in Scripture of supernatural or superhuman power. It means to work energetically, effectively, and or efficiently to put forth energy to be at work to produce results. Now, this is different than the word, uh, you know, some of the word you might see the word dunamis, which also means to work or to have energy. And that is normally associated with man-made energy. This is associated with a supernatural sense. The word energeo is used 21 times in the New Testament. 18 of those are in Paul's writings, and he uses it exclusively to describe supernatural power. In other words, something that we are unable to accomplish on our own. If you want to look even deeper into this phrase, you can go into the classical Greek. And in the classical Greek, this word is used almost exclusively uh, in regard to the manner in which medicine does its work in the body of one who is ill. And so when you think about it in terms of that, uh, when, when you are ill or you are sick and you have medis- medication that's supposed to take care of that illness, it is not something that you do actively. You simply take the medicine and you allow the medicine to run its course and to take care of the issue. And that's what Paul is saying is happening here with the Thessalonian believers. He's saying the gospel, the word of God, is so powerful that its power is supernatural. Its power is from God because it has the power to change your heart. You see, we have a problem in our hearts. We have a problem in our hearts. There's a, there's a battle going on in people's hearts. And it's a battle between uh, you know, the, the sin nature and the Holy Spirit for those of you who have placed your faith and your trust in the, word, in the Lord and in Jesus for your salvation. 
In this case, he's saying the gospel has the power to affect change in someone's heart by transforming it. Like, like medication takes care of an issue in, in, in an ill person. The gospel does the same thing in our ill hearts. The word of God alone, the gospel alone, has the power to change a person's heart because God alone is able to accomplish such a change. You can't sit there and look at, it, at something and say, okay, change my, my, I want to make my heart change today. I'm going to be the one that changes my heart. I'm going to be doing this. It has to come from God. That's what we're told in Scripture, and that's what Paul's laying out here. The message that they brought to the Thessalonians was powerful. It was from God, and the Word of God and the Gospel have the power to change your heart. It changed the hearts of the Thessalonians. It can do it for all of us. We see this in other places in Scripture as well. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says this, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and or spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. If you want to hear it from a little bit of a different perspective, uh, maybe you've heard of, of a man by the name of Ravi Zacharias. And uh, if you're not familiar with Ravi Zacharias, he's one of the, one of the probably the, the greatest apologists uh, of our time or maybe any time. Uh, just unbelievably fascinating. You can go and you can look it up, look look him up online and see some of his his writings. Probably find some sermons, different things. And it just his whole thing was to, he would sit down with people and just rationally discuss Christianity and, and how it works and and how it's the truth and all of these things. And, and I want to read you a quote from him because it talks about the power that God has to change hearts through His Word. He says this: the Christian faith, simply stated, reminds us that our fundamental problem is not moral. Rather, our fundamental problem is spiritual. It is not just that we are immoral, but that a moral life alone cannot bridge what separates us from God. Herein lies the cardinal difference between the moralizing religions and Jesus' offer to us. Jesus does not offer to make bad people good, but to make dead people alive. Now last I checked, we cannot do that on our own. It takes supernatural energeo, supernatural power that only comes from God. And Paul is telling the Thessalonians that's the kind of power that they experience through God's word changing their hearts, bringing them from death to life. The word of God has the power to change hearts. And then the other side of that, the word of God has the power to change lives. Not only does the word of God have have that power to change hearts. It changes our lives as well. And what we mean by lives is, uh, you know, we, we, mean, we mean conduct, all right? So the gospel first changes our hearts. It changes who we are. It changes our identity. We are now, when you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, uh, you, you actually have your identity changed. You become a child of God. And so uh, you become a co-heir with Christ. And these are all promises found in Scripture, and so once your heart is changed, then as a result of that changed heart, the Word of God also has the power to change our conduct. It can change the way we live our lives, how we live. Paul points to the evidence of this in the lives of the Thessalonian believers when he says in verse 14, For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. Now this once again goes back and kind of harkens back to the previous verses where Paul is referring to the evidence of changed lives in the Thessalonians by referring to them becoming imitators of Paul and Silas and Timothy. He says, we are imitating God, we are imitating Jesus, and you're imitating us. We talked about that in chapter 1. So here again, he's referring to a similar change of conduct. But in this case, it's more from a corporate sense. And he's referring to them, he connects them not to imitating their teachers, but to imitating the church in the bigger picture. And you might hear this a lot said that, you know, right now we talk about, you know, welcome to Trinity Church Online. And, and we say that at the beginning of every one of our, of, our, of our videos during this time. And when we're able to meet in person again, we're going to welcome people to Trinity Church. But the bottom line is that we are not, uh, you know, as an individual entity, the church. We are part of the church as a bigger whole. It's, it's the, the church is made up of all the believers everywhere. All right? And Paul is drawing that comparison and connecting the Thessalonians to the church on a bigger scale here. 
and he says that they are imitators of the churches in other areas of the world, and specifically he points out Judea. And Paul uses the example of the churches in Judea for a very specific reason, because the experience, they, they were experiencing, or they had experienced, opposition and specifically persecution because of the gospel, and, and the Thessalonians could relate to that because they had experienced the same thing. And Paul's connection of them as imitators of, the, uh, of them is that they, their conduct reflected the, the power of the gospel to change their hearts because when they faced opposition, when they faced persecution, much like the church in, in, in Judea, they were able to stand up under it and bear up underneath the pressure of that persecution and opposition. And in fact, not, not just survive, but to thrive. And so that leads us to our, to our fourth and, and final point about the Word of God. Now, the Word of God, first and foremost, it's, it's from God through man. It has the power to change our hearts, and it has the power to change our lives as a result of a changed heart. And then finally, and, and this is a little scary sometimes, it will stir up opposition. It, it just, it will. Here's what he says. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets, And drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them at last. So what Paul's doing here is Paul's drawing the connection of the Thessalonians becoming imitators of the churches in Judea because of their similarities or because they both experienced and they have a connection through experiencing opposition and persecution. Now Paul was in a a very unique spot to speak uh, on this in particular because he was there in Thessalonica he he founded the church he planted it and he was only able to be there for a short period of time as we talked about a couple of weeks ago because of the amount of opposition that that he faced in fact he was persecuted he was driven out and he went to the next city over and then they actually followed him to the next city and drove him out of there as well And so the Thessalonians had seen this, they had witnessed it, and now over the course of time they were experiencing that opposition and that persecution themselves. And Paul is commending them for the way they responded. Paul's commending them for the way that they were imitators of the other churches and they responded in a very similar way and they they were thankful to the Lord for what he had done and they still served him and they endured this opposition. They stood up in the face of the opposition, they endured the persecution as needed. And so, as I mentioned, Paul was kind of in a unique situation here because not only did he experience the the, the persecution in Thessalonica, but when we talk about the church in Judea, Paul had a very unique view on the persecution and the opposition that they faced as well. And specifically, he was part of it. Paul had been a Pharisee. Paul, if you look at the book of Acts, began, we we are introduced to Paul not as, as an apostle, but as a young man who at the stoning of Stephen is standing there approving of it as people are laying their cloaks at his feet. He was one of the the people who spearheaded the persecution of the church in Judea. And that was one of the reasons that the church began to spread out into Samaria and into Asia and into all these other places uh, we, we see in Scripture and in the book of Acts. And so since Paul himself was at least partially responsible for some of that persecution, it he also had a unique experience about responding to it. Because what do we say about the Word of God? That it comes from God, right? And it happens to come through man. We, we talk about the Bible, we talk about Paul's preaching. What does the Word of God do? It changes our hearts. And when it changes our hearts, what comes next? It changes our, our what? Our actions. It changes our lives. And then it stirs up opposition. Well, think about Paul's life. Paul was one of the people who was opposing the church. He was, he was the one who was the, the persecutor, the opposer. And then on one journey, and he's on the road to Damascus, he's one, going down the road to persecute believers in a different city. He meets face-to-face Jesus himself, the resurrected Lord. He experiences firsthand the word of God. And what happens? His heart is changed. His heart is changed. He, in fact, God changes his name from Saul to Paul. And what's the result of Paul's changed heart? Well, he returns to where he to Jerusalem and different places, and people were actually terrified of him. 
They're scared to death of him because they know the things that he has done. They know his actions. And so when they hear him saying, I'm different, I'm changed because of what Jesus did for me on that cross, and he spoke to me, and he, 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 he has called me to him, they didn't believe him. But because Paul's heart was changed, his conduct changed. His actions changed. And that is what people then began to believe that they saw his conduct change, so then they understood that Paul had, his heart had changed because he had heard the word of God. He had heard the gospel, in his case, directly from the mouth of Jesus himself. And then if you continue to go through the book of Acts, and even the book of, you know, we talk about the first Thessalonians, we've been digging into it, the, 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 the founding of the Thessalonian church, most of that opposition and persecution was aimed not at the Thessalonian believers, but at Paul himself. And so his encounter with the word of God, it changed his heart, it changed his life, and it stirred up opposition. But how did Paul respond? How, how did he respond? He continued, he understood that, you know what, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Jesus experienced opposition. Paul points out in him he was crucified because of his teaching. Paul experienced opposition. The Thessalonian church experienced opposition. They experienced persecution. Paul's making the claim here that the object of the opposition and the persecution is not the Thessalonians themselves, but the gospel. The people that are doing this are opposed to the message of the gospel. And we face similar opposition today. He states pretty clearly this will happen. He states pretty clearly that the world will hate his disciples. Jesus does. Why? Well, part of it's the word of God claims to be the truth. John 17, Jesus prayed for his disciples before he went to the cross. And this is what he said. In John 17, 14 through 17, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. That word truth's a little bit dangerous today, isn't it? By claiming to have or to know the truth, uh, it, if that clashes with the beliefs of somebody else, uh, you're by default saying that what they believe isn't, isn't the truth. But Jesus himself said this in John 14, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's pretty clear that it's not about here. There's multiple options and multiple roads that lead to God. The example some people will use of a mountain, and we got to get to the peak of the mountain. There's different paths that go up each side. It's just not, it's not realistic. It's not true. And that's the words of Jesus himself. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In fact, John, to connect this to the Word, calls Jesus the Word in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Ravi Zacharias, who I mentioned earlier, said it this way, We have a right to believe whatever we want, but not everything we believe is right. The Bible claims to be the truth. It claims to be the word of God. The message of the gospel is that Jesus is the only way to God. So we can expect the word of God, we can expect the gospel to be opposed. Paul said it like this in 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. And then again in chapter 2, 4, and 5, he says, And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. What, what we're proclaiming when we open the Word of God, when we preach, when we teach the Word of God, it, Look, this is not about what I have to say. This is not about what anybody has to say. It's, the question is, what is God trying to teach you this morning? What is he saying to your heart? What is he speaking to your heart through his word? And while Paul, as an apostle, can claim that his preaching was the word of God, 
I can make no such claim and I don't make any such claim. All I can say is that I am trying and attempting to bring you the word that we have, the, the revelation of God that he's given, given to us, the Bible. I can't change your heart. I can't change your behavior or your life. I can't do any of it. Only the word of God impacting your heart by the power of the Holy Spirit through the message of the gospel, what Jesus Christ did on the cross for you can change your heart, can change your life, can change your world. And for those of you who have placed your faith and trust in him and you're frustrated because you know what, you've you got family members who don't and, and they, kind of, they mock you a little bit or they, they don't want to be around you because they, they don't want to hear about the gospel. It can be frustrating. It can be intimidating. Or maybe you're facing some more blatant opposition in some form. The bottom line is trust the Lord. Don't be surprised because the gospel is exclusive. In fact, it, it, it just is. Jesus was exclusive. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And yet, at the same time, he was inclusive because he said, anybody who, who, who wants to come can come. That's the, the message of the gospel. And no matter what this world throws at us, no matter what happens around us, we can be certain of God's word. We can be certain of the message of the gospel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to open your word. Lord, my prayer, as always, is that what I say, it's immaterial, Lord. What do you have to say through your word to our hearts this morning? Lord, speak to us through your word. We thank you for the opportunity to open it. We thank you for the the gift you've given us of your word and of the Bible, Lord. We thank you for the message of the gospel that is outlined through your word. The truth of what your, you loved us so much that you sent your son to take our place, to pay the penalty for our sins and die on that cross. We deserved it because we are separated from you. You are holy, we are sinful. But Jesus paid that price. He took care of it. He rose again three days later to defeat death, to defeat sin, so that when we do place our faith and our trust in him, we have the gift of eternal life waiting for us. We have the forgiveness of our sins, Lord. We have a restored relationship with you. Lord, my prayer is that, that our, the members of our church and, and those that are hearing this would spend time in the word during the, these, these days where we might have a little extra time on our hands, being at home. Spend some of that time in the word because in uncertain times, we can be certain of the truth that is found in the word of God. We thank you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, have a great week and remember as always, you are loved. Oh, man.